Greetings and salutations all my friends. Hello and welcome to another informative video on internal medicine algorithms and mnemonics. God bless you. My name is Ryan. Today we're we'll talking about Marfan syndrome. This is the outline of our talk today. We're going to be covering a clinical case. Then we're going to be delving into Marfan syndrome, looking at the clinical features, the hints, nosology, which is how we diagnose Marfan's in terms of the diagnostic criteria associations, differential diagnoses, investigations, and management. And then, of course, we're going to close with encouragement from the Bible. Fasten your seatbelts, everybody. Here we go. Let's just get my pen in there. All righty. So a 20-year-old man is evaluated during a routine physical examination prior to playing for a college basketball team. Now, he was recruited to play on the team and offered a scholarship after being noticed for his exceptional skills on a junior national team abroad. Well done. His medical history is significant for prior treatment for tuberculosis at the age of 13. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. He presently takes no medications, sorry about the typo, and has no allergies. His father died of sudden cardiac death, oh dear, at the age of 46. Now, no autopsy was performed. Other family uh, members in his father's family have died at young ages from cardiac conditions. Mm, the plot thickens. His mother is healthy. His height is 200.6 centimeters. So he's quite a tall guy. His weight is 89.8 kilograms. His BMI is 22.3. Sorry. You notice that his torso is short relative to his limbs. That's a big tip off. His arm span measures a whopping 210 centimeters. So that's actually greater than his height. Mm. He also has pectus excavatum and arachnodactyly. A high arch palate is also present. He wears glasses for severe myopia and has had ectopia lentis on the right. On cardiovascular examination, there is a two out of four blowing diastolic murmur noted in the third left interspace. He is anxious to begin practicing with his basketball team. What is your advice at this time as a treating physician? Is it A, he is not safe for further competitive basketball or any other strenuous activity for that matter? B, he is safe to resume physical activity without further evaluation? C, he may continue to practice with the team while further evaluation with an echo, slit lamp examination and genetic testing is performed? Or is it D, he should be placed on a beta blocker and then can resume physical activity? Hmm. Nice to ask. Okay, guys, let's dig in. What is Marfan syndrome? It is a connective tissue disorder inherited as an autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance due to mutation of the fibrillin 1 gene, which is a component of the extracellular matrix. Now, fibrillin gene is located where? On the long arm of chromosome 15, precisely location uh, chromosome 15Q21. Uh, males and females are equally affected. So there's no predilection for any specific gender because we said the mode of inheritance is autosomal dominant and is characterized by a triad of abnormalities. Eyes, skeleton, heart. Eyes, skeleton, heart. Okay. So in the eyes, what we look at is um, so the patients often, you know, they may present with a blue sclera subluxation or dislocation of the lens, which is what we call ectopia lentis, and we'll see how this compares with homocystinuria later on, iridodonesis, which speaks to tremor of the iris, heterochromia iris, which speaks to various colors of the iris, they may have myopia, as in our clinical case, retinal detachment, and eventually glaucoma. The skeletal features of Marfan syndrome, so the patients tend to be tall, Oh, sorry, let's go back for that one. Tall, lean, and thin with arachnodactyly and hyperextensible joints. They have a high arch palate. They may have kyphosis or scoliosis with a high pedal arch or pes planus. They may have pectus excavatum, carinatum, or chest asymmetry. What about cardiovascular, guys? Yes, we noticed the two out of four early diastolic murmur in the clinical case. So these patients may have aortic regurgitation. Why is that? Because of dilation of the beloved aortic root. And you can also have it being secondary to cystic medial necrosis of the aorta. You can also end up with mitral regurgitation due to mitral valve prolapse. Very important note, red robot for stop. Marfan syndrome may cause dissecting aneurysm, infective nicoditis, and may be associated with aortic coarctation. 
Just remember that it may be associated with number one, the septic aortic aneurysm, number two, infectivity conitis, and maybe number three, associated with coarctation of the aorta. Now, the diagnosis in Marfan syndrome can be made if you have a positive family history and features in two of the different systems that we mentioned, the eye, the skeletal, or the CVS, or features in all three systems without the family history. That's the eye, skeletal, and cardiovascular features. Now, this is a a beautiful diagram taken from McLeod's, just illustrating some of the features of Marfan syndrome. So what we can see here is this gentleman is quite tall, and he has a reduced uh, upper segment to lower segment ratio, right? So his arm span is greater than his actual height, right? He also had surgery. Uh, you can see the midline scar, probably because he had an aortic dissection before. So this is the picture B shows the long fingers, which we have, which we call arachnodactyly. C shows us the very high arch palate that we can see here. And D speaks of dislocation of the lens. Okay, so this is the diagnostic criteria. It's called the revised hint nosology, right? So we, um, we apportion points to each of these clinical features and a composite score of more than seven indicates systemic involvement. So just to go through this quickly, we got pictures coming up of the wrist and thumb sign. If you got wrist and thumb sign, it gives you a beloved three points. If you got wrist or thumb sign, a beloved one point. The pectus carinatum owns you two points. Pectus excavatum or chest asymmetry, one point, right? If you got a hind foot deformity, two points. Plain pes planus, one point. Pneumothorax, two points. Judelectasia, two points. Protrusio acetabuli, two points. If you've got a reduced upper to lower segment ratio, it owns you one point. Or if you've got increased arm span to height and no severe scoliosis, one point. If you do have scoliosis or thoracolumbar kyphosis, that earns you one point. Reduced elbow extension, which is less than 170 degrees with full extension, is one point. Facial features, you must have at least three of the following five features. That compositely only earns you one point, according to revised hint. So that's dolico carefully, which speaks to a reduced cephalic index or head width to length ratio. In ophthalmos, down slanting, palpable fissure, malar hypoplasia, and retrognathia. If you've got three out of the five, that earns you one point. Stria in the skin earns you one point. Much of our prolapse, which is also termed um, Barlow syndrome earns you one point. So a composite score of seven or more indicates systemic involvement. Alrighty. More pictures. So here we find um, in the first picture on the left we have arachnodactyly. Once again the spider-like long fingers. Here we have arachnodactyly involving both the fingers and the toes. Note how long they are. This is the Steinberg sign, okay, which is what we call the thumb sign. This is dislocation of the lens once more, the high arch palate once more, pectus excavatum. Alrighty. So this is the thumb plus the wrist sign compositely. Yeah, basically, if you've got both, then you get just three points. If you've got either one, you get one point, right? So on the upper panel here, we see the thumb sign. So you ask the patient, does the entire nail of your thumb project beyond the ulnar border? Right, the ulnar border is uh, uh, here, right? Off your hand when you clinch your hand but, uh, without assistance, alrighty? And then the wrist sign is shown here. You ask the patient, does the thumb overlap the terminal phalanx of your fifth digit while you grasp your contralateral wrist? Right, so thumb sign and wrist sign respectively. Outline other associations of Marfan syndrome, nice to ask. Okay, so it's associated with cystic disease in the lung, which is known to cause spontaneous pneumothorax. So watch out for that. It can cause bullae, apical fibrosis, aspergilloma, and our beloved bronchiectasis. Right, it can also have an association with inguinal or femoral hernia and also with a small nodule or papule in the skin of the neck, which is what we affectionately term Mishker's elastoma. All right. What is a possible differential for Marfan syndrome? And it's a beautiful condition we call homocystinuria. Well, not so beautiful, but it's there, homocystinuria. And that is due to deficiency of the enzyme cystathionine synthetase, cystathionine synthetase, right? And these are the common uh, ways to differentiate these two entities clinically, all right? Let's just put this there for now and get my pointer in there. So the first is the mode of inheritance. Homocystinuria is autosomal recessive versus Marfan's, which is autosomal dominant, right? And the direction of the dislocation of the lens is another clue because in homocystinuria, that lens is dislocated pansy downwards, but in Marfan syndrome, it's dislocated pezulu upwards, right?
Uh, in terms of the skeletal abnormality, in homocystinuria, osteoporosis is common, somewhat less common in marfans, but in marfans you get the pes planus, the flat foot, the scoliosis, the pectus excavatum, which are more common features. Aortic regurgitation is common in marfans, but not so common in homocystinuria. Mental retardation is common in homocystinuria, not so much in marfans. Vascular sequelae, uh, homocystinuria, uh, these patients are prone to develop thrombosis, right? But marfan symptom, not so. Life expectancy in homocystinuria is significantly reduced because of cardiovascular risk. But Marfan syndrome doesn't portend this risk as much. If we do a test in the urine, homocystinuria would be positive for cyanide, nitroprusside, but Marfan is negative for that. And spectroscopic examination of the urine, homocysteine is detected with homocystinuria. <laughs> right, that would be expected, but not so with Marfan. Pyroxene may cause a response in homocystinuria, but not so in Marfan. So, right? so those are 10 differences how you can tease out the difference between homocystinuria and Marfan syndrome. One of the complications or causes of death in Marfan syndrome, well, the most, probably one of the most serious ones, the dissecting aneurysm, right? Heart failure, infective endocarditis as well. How are you going to investigate Marfan syndrome? So a good place to start is the x-ray of the chest, which may be normal, but may also demonstrate features of aortic aneurysm. You may have unfolding or a widened mediastinum. Uh, pneumothorax or scoliosis may be present right on the back of cystic lung disease, which is an association. An ECG to detect any arrhythmia, because remember also you're looking for underlying aortic regurg, mitral regurgitation, which may cause specific changes, may precipitate an arrhythmia. Echocardiogram is going to show, may show mitral valve prolapse, aortic uh, regurgitation, in which case you want to try and establish the dimensions of that aortic root, mitral regurgitation, and of course, like we said, dilation of the aortic root. CT MRI to see aortic dilatation. How are we going to treat Marfan syndrome? So first up, we speak to medical treatment. So a beta blocker is a good idea because what this does is it reduces aortic dilatation and prevents the risk of aortic rupture or dissecting aneurysm. A tenolol is preferable. An ACE inhibitor. So in Marfan syndrome, there is upregulation of terminal necrosis factor beta, not alpha, beta, which is specifically inhibited by an ACE inhibitor, right, which once again negates or prevents aortic root dilatation. This also, we need to also include prophylaxis for infective endocarditis. From a surgical standpoint, if elective replacement of the uh, ACE and aorta and aortic valve uh, is a good practice in patients with progressive dilatation of the aorta, right? So if it's above 5 centimeters, we opt more for surgical treatment, all right? Uh, then, of course, advice to the patient is probably the most critical aspect of our approach to managing Marfan's, right? That the patient should avoid strenuous exercise to prevent aortic dissection. Talk about genetic counseling and the autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance, right? Regular checkup and an annual echocardiogram to look at that aortic root dilation dimension, okay? What is the effect on pregnancy of Marfan syndrome? So pregnancy in general is well tolerated if there's no other serious cardiac problem. Uh, it is avoided if the aortic root is dilated more than 4 cm with concomitant aortic regurgitation because of risk of aneurysm formation right, and rupture. Maternal death may occur due to aortic dissection during pregnancy. Early premature abortion may also occur. Echo should be done generally every 6 to 8 weeks throughout pregnancy and 6 monthly postpartum. The blood pressure should, should be monitored regularly and vaginal delivery is indeed possible, but C-section is not done routinely. Now, if that aortic arch is above 4.5 centimeters, delivery should be done by no later than 39 weeks by induction or by C-section. Beta blockers should be continued throughout pregnancy, all right? So guys, back to our clinical case. So we had this young gentleman, 20 years old, he's playing basketball, had TB before at the age of 13. His dad, he's got a family history of sudden cardiac death. His dad died at the age of 46. Other family members have also died quite young but his mom is healthy. He's got, you know, um, a height of 200, but an arm span of 210. So he's got, um, you know, an increased uh, arm to width uh, ratio, if you like. His BMI is 22.3. He has high arch palate. He has severe myopia, atopia lentis. He has an EDM, uh, which speaks to aortic regurg. He definitely has clinical stigmata of Marfan syndrome. How are you going to advise him? Dum -da -da -dum. He is not safe for further competitive basketball or any other strenuous activity already. 
Um, so although in this case there is no definite family diagnosis, the sudden death of his dad is likely to represent an aortic aneurysm rupture, and there's also a history of other family members having demise early because of cardiac causes. Now, in the most recent diagnostic criteria, which is the device hentonosology, an echo would be required for definite diagnosis to evaluate aortic root dilatation. However, because this patient has several of the clinical features and a murmur concerning for aortic root uh, dilation and hence subsequent regurgitation, an echo would not be required before acting in his best interest and removing him from any further physical activity. Okay, okay, my friends, I hope that you'll allow me to just encourage you for a few moments on faithfulness from the Bible. The book of Luke chapter 16 verse 10, Jesus says, one who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. Look, God has blessed us. He has blessed you with talents, with giftings, and what we do with that is so important because if we are faithful with the little that God entrusts to us, right, be it in the way of resources, be it in the way of talents and abilities and skills, be it in the way of money and possessions, whatever we have, if we glorify God by being diligent and industrious with that, then we will be blessed with more and more so that we can manage it responsibly for the kingdom. All right, have yourself a fantastic day. I'll see you soon. We're going to be talking about atrial fibrillation soon. Excited about that one. Take care. Have a lovely day.